As a precursor kind of into what we're getting into today, I want to share something with you. I, um, I, this is from April of 2016, so it's, it's, a, it's a little bit old. And it's from the Biblical Leadership website. And the article reads this way. It says that we have surveyed over 200,000 people from across 20 plus countries, all different kinds of faiths and walks of life. And we've asked them questions about prayer, sacred texts, their beliefs and their practices. The finding, I, I was afraid that we had to, there was an earthquake or something coming, but as but I know, I know. So we're okay. The finding is known as the power of four, and it can simply be stated this way. The life of someone who engages in Scripture four or more times a week. <laughs> we're probably going to have several people who have that happen. Four or more times a week looks radically different from the life of someone who does not. I wanted to share this because as we get into scripture that, you know, sometimes people are like, well, why do you got to read the Bible? Well, here's the answer. The lives of Christians who do not engage in the Bible most days of the week are statistically the same as the lives of non-Christians. So just because we say we're a Christian and we believe in Jesus, the lives of those of us who do not engage in some capacity into scripture in fact, the power of four, the concept is four times a week. So at least, you know, every other day. If we're not doing that, then our lives are going to be the same as people who don't know Jesus at all. That's what this is saying. And then it gives some other specifics about the effect of, and it doesn't say, this article didn't say in an hour of Bible study. It doesn't say anything in regard to the time at all. It just says people who are giving their brain and their heart opportunity to digest something of God's word four times a week. You can do all seven days if you want to. It doesn't say you don't. Yeah. <laughs> so controlling for differences in gender, age, church attendance, prayer habits, small group participation, and most other factors you would think would matter. Someone who engages the Bible four or more days a week is... 228%, again, 200,000 people surveyed, 228% more likely to share their faith with others. 231% more likely to be discipling someone else. 60% less likely to feel spiritually stagnant. We hear that regular. Boy, I just, I'm dry. I, so you're 60% less likely to feel that if you're just exposing yourself to Scripture. 59% less likely to view pornography. 30% less likely to struggle with loneliness. 31% less likely to struggle with forgiving others. I could have left that one off because <laughs> it kind of makes us feel better sometimes. They need to forgive they need to offer forgiveness. So I know that this is a Christian-based website. And because of that, we're going to go, well, those statistics, that 200 blah, 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 percent, and, you know, how is that? And then this is a Christian. So they're going to up the ante. So the question that I would say in response to that is this, how far do they have to up it from the actual in order for it still to be relevant? You know, if you're... If it's not 30% less likely to struggle with loneliness, if it's only 20%, isn't that still worth it? If any of those statistics are, are less because you think that they're promoting this concept, you know, over the top, at what point does it become enough to say, I think I'll start reading my Bible a little bit more? Okay. That said, the language of the marketplace, if you, part two, if you would turn in your Bibles, so this can count as one. If you would turn in your Bible to Acts chapter 17, if you have it, uh, if you have it with you, we're going to go 
uh, verse for verse. I'm not going to make you stand right now. But I'm going to read through this in the NIV, and you can follow along. We're going to pick up, like I said, in a verse-by-verse look at it pretty quickly. Starting with verse 22, chapter 17. It says, Paul then stood up in the meeting of Areopagus and said, of the Areopagus, and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around... And I looked carefully at your objects of worship. I I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. and does not live in temples built by human hands. He is not served by human hands as if he needed anything, rather he, for, rather he gives, I'm sorry, rather he himself gives everyone life and breath and everyone, everything else. Verse 26. From one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the, old, the whole earth, and, and he marked out their appointed times and history and the boundaries of their lands. Verse 27, and you can underline this because we're going to come back to it at the very end. God did this. So that they would seek him. Perhaps reach out for him. And find him. Though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As as some of your own poets have said. We are his offspring. And therefore since we are God's offspring. We should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone. An image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man that he appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. And when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. But others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. And at that, Paul left the council. And some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. And among them was... Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, Damaris, and a number of others. Lord, bless your word. We've already been told that you have the ability to do that in our lives and change us and transform us. So let that process happen right now in me, in us. Amen. So first, a little bit of the Greek, because that's what I've been doing for a while. And there's a handful of things here that I think are are valuable for us to look at. First, you notice in verse 22, this areopagus, that comes from the word ares in Greek. In Roman, it's Mars. So it's the Greek god of war. And it literally means Greek god of war. Pagos means rocky hill. So the equivalent in Roman uh, mythology is Mars Hill, which we're more familiar with. Not the church, but the location. We have a a picture, I think, uh, just so you can see what this looks like. So you see the city of Athens. I said last week, at the time of this writing, roughly 140, 150,000 people... And this is the location, this rocky hill, uh, where they would meet and hold court. You can take that down now. Um, F.F. Bruce writes in his commentary, It, this court of meeting, this rocky area, had supreme authority in religious matters and seems to have had the power at this time to appoint public lectures and exercise some control over them in the interest of public order. In other words, if something was happening within the city, within the marketplace, and there was a stir happening, then this is where those folks would be taken, up to that rocky hill, and they'd kind of hold court and debate about what was going on. There's a couple things that I, I kind of noticed in, as we've been moving through Acts and in the last couple of weeks. The first thing is that wherever Paul goes, he's in, invited to speak somewhere, And there's some that don't want it to happen, but he is invited to speak somewhere about this message of Christ. Get that concept. He is invited. 
It's interesting. Um, I had a conversation last week uh, with someone out, on the fo- out in the foyer, and we were talking about Paul. And his comment to me, and I would have agreed with it, was he said, you know, his personality in so many ways, it seems like he's kind of an intolerable guy. He was tough to get along with. And, and I think I kind of agree with that, but it is interesting. He was tough on some things, but still, they kept inviting him into conversations. So maybe he's not quite as intolerable as we think. And if you follow this, one of the things I've noticed in going through Acts again is that Paul, while he can be pretty straightforward and difficult, he also applies grace to a whole lot of situations. And he reminds people of the grace of God. If you go to some of his writings after the book of Acts, the the things he writes to churches, he talks a lot about grace. And so even though he seems to get into trouble and maybe is intolerable, He's obviously not what he was called last Sunday, a babbler. And people, when they get to understand who he is, they understand also that he's very intelligent. And people ask him to expand on the God that he knows. Hmm. Wouldn't it be great to be consistently invited to expand on the Christ that you know. I, I loved hearing what Carrie said. You know, we, I got here. I didn't quite get here, but I got here. And she got to this place because, in her own words, because I was able to share of the love that God had put into me. Somehow, I think that that's, that's apparent also in Paul. Also in verse 22... Uh, there is a phrase, let me go back there. I see in every way that you are very religious, which is an interesting word, isn't it? Or an interesting phrase. In, in the Greek, all of the, the, those words combine for a long Greek word, dice di monasteros. Say that with me. No, I won't make it. <laughs> the first part is, is easy, dicey, you know, maybe that's how we want to remember it. Dicey di monasteros. And it's written here in English as very religious. But if you go to the Greek, the translation there is very superstitious. I've noticed that you are very superstitious people. And it also combines superstition with an added element of fear. So you're very superstitious and kind of fearful. And if you think of Greek gods and Roman gods, yeah. But it opens the door. It, it says too, well, before I get to that next part. In essence, what he says is you're very devout without really knowing God. Or in your case, God's. And in the next verse, verse 23, he says, I noticed this one place that is known as a, a worship place unto the unknown God. This is used just one time in all of the New Testament. Uh, The Greek for that phrase, unknown God, is agnostos theos. Agnostos. What do you think we get from that? Agnostic. You don't even know this God, but you worship And so he goes on to say, the word that he uses, so you worship this unknown or unknowable God in ignorance, which seems like a pretty harsh word. But what it really kind of comes out to saying is it's like you go to worship this God you don't even know. And when you're in the middle of that worship, you kind of look the other way of all the things about this God. Or that you don't know about this God. So it's not, when we say, oh, you're ignorant, that can feel like a pretty harsh condemnation to someone. But what he's saying is, in essence, you look the other way at all these things that you don't know about him. So then the scripture tells us that he shares about Jesus. We get down to verse 32. And they mock or ridicule him. 
This word that's used there, actually the word in the uh, NIV that I read says sneered. Several sneered at him. And it means to mock or ridicule. That word is only used twice. It's interesting because they're both in the book of Acts. And the first time it's used is in, is in Acts chapter 2, verse 13. And it has to do with when the disciples pour out of the upper room and they begin speaking in all these different languages and the people mock them or sneered at them and said they have had too much wine. Verse 34 we're told that people become followers and believers and without, uh, without going into depth on those two things because of the time we have today. The word followers means to join or attach oneself. The root of that is the same word in Greek as glue. Kolao. So these people heard what Paul had to say. Some sneered and mocked him. Others glued themselves to him, in essence. I want to talk a few moments here. Um, and I think I'm going to go ahead and ask the worship team to come up. Very quickly, three principles as we wrap this up today. There is a difference between, in your outline, knowing about God and knowing God. And Paul has just highlighted all of that in this brief discourse that he gives them. He says, in essence, that you guys have a positive respect for God. I can see that. I see that in your city. I see that in your statues, memorializing your Greek gods. But you don't really know them. I, I remember... Do you remember... Some of you here, some of you over here, maybe not because you're too young, but you remember Y2K? You remember Y2K? Uh, year 2000? And there, okay, thank you, John. And there went throughout the land <laughs> some great fear or concern to an unknown God. Because we don't know what's going to happen because it's the year 2000. You remember that? There was lots of discourse about that. It, it was on the news on a regular. What's going to happen? There was this fear of all these different things. When I was reading this, that's kind of where my brain went to. And I had some conversations with people. And, and here was the thing. It, it, went, it was kind of like this. I said, so what are you afraid of? I don't know. It's a mystery, but something could happen. And my thoughts were just this. I said, that hints at the idea that you think somebody is paying attention. You're not giving them a name attached to any of that. Now, there were, you know, Christians that were troubled probably by Y2K as well. But a lot of the folks that I talked to specifically, they were just concerned that there is a God. I don't know him or how they exist. But I have a fear right alongside my not knowing. I think that's what Paul is trying to point at. And I think that that's where we live right now. Again, I come back to this post-Christian, post-modern understanding of faith today. And the avenue that we have to share, it's, it's in those kind of situations. It's going to be people who might have some superstitious understanding of God, but they don't really know him. And that is the perfect time for us who say we do. We know him personally. He lives within us to have the opportunity to step up and present some things that maybe they haven't heard through love, and through hope. I want to skip down to the very end in your outline. I know I'm skipping a whole section here, but that's okay. So the heart of it all, I went right past in, in our reading here. I ask you to underline it, but it's verse 27. God did this. This is what Paul is putting forth so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any of us. I think that's the heart of this whole getting into the marketplace conversation idea. 
God sent us into the marketplace. God sends us into the marketplace. We're not always really prepared. We don't have a set of notes that we're going to bring in. I got a call from uh, Grantley last night. Um, someone called our house about going to uh, Valley Medical Center. I didn't know the number, so I let it go to message, and then I read it, and then I called them, and they told me they had gotten a hold of Grantley, so I said, good, he'll do well. But he was invited then to come and share some hope with a family who had just had a stillborn baby. And I was talking to Grantley here a few minutes ago about how that went, and it, was, it wasn't great. <laughs> it was uncomfortable for a number of reasons, and you can ask Grantley about that later. But that's why we're here. That's why we're called to be a part and, and be in the marketplace in order that when, when we're brought in, there is this possibility that a known God, a known Savior, who like verse 27 said, let me read it one more time. That they could reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any of us. In the middle of superstition, in the middle of everything else that is a distraction from the true God, he has put us in places that we can step in and, and draw the net, so to speak, to, to, to bring into the process our known Jesus, our Savior. Would you stand? And we don't start necessarily with quoting scripture i you know it's exactly carry your your story fit perfect we don't necessarily start with scripture unless that's a foundation that's already been laid we don't start we certainly don't start with debate i i found a quote here i'm going to put this up on the board it was or on the uh, screen here it was written anybody ever read wrinkle in time a few of you madeline langle i think is how you say this is from her she said we do not draw people to christ so loudly discrediting what they believe by telling them how wrong they are and how right we are but by showing them a light that is so lovely that they want with all their hearts to know the source of it that's why we go into the marketplace. That's why we don't just stay here and huddle up all the time. And pat each other on the back and never go outside this place and share. But so that they can be drawn into a light that with all their hearts, they want to know the source of it. As Paul said, there is a God reaching out and he is close. He's never been far. Let's sing together, and then we'll pray in just a moment. Who am I that the highest would well 